Good morning, everyone. My name is Duduzile Kupeka, your grade 11 life sciences teacher. So today, the topic to be covered are diseases of the respiratory system, as well as the effects of smoking and altitude on gaseous exchange. So we're wrapping it up. We understood the processes of gaseous exchange, the organs involved in gaseous exchange, as well as the muscles involved in. Now we are understanding, we're going to be getting into the diseases that affect the respiratory system. So these are the diseases and disorders that affect the human breathing system, right? So when you have these, any one of these, plus the list is more. So these are just a few common ones. There's TB, which is tuberculosis. There's asthma. We have hay fever, bronchitis, emphysema, and lung cancer. So we've heard of these diseases, right? We've heard of them quite a lot of times. These here affect your, your gaseous exchange or your respiratory system. So they might affect different parts of the respiratory system. You know, others would affect your lungs, others would affect your nasal cavity, others would affect your alveoli, others would affect your bronchi and bronchioles. So it's really different aspects that are affected and that would then determine the disease or disorder that you have. The one many might be familiar with is hay fever, especially now when we change seasons. When there's more pollen in the air and there's maybe dust particles in the air, people tend to have, you know, when you, you have more time where you have sinuses, that's what we call them, but it's usually when you are sneezing quite a lot more often because of all that pollen in the air. There's a lot of them, lung cancer. One of the causes of lung cancer would be smoking, you know, when you inhale too much of this uh, dirty air, if I can say, the smoke from cigarettes or smoke if you stay maybe around an area with a lot of smoke happening, then you might, have, you might be affected by that. So we've, we've come across all of these from time to time. Yeah? And then let's get into TB for now. TB, South Africa, we'll cover this because why? South Africa has one of the highest rates of TB in the world. Can you imagine that? And TB is curable, that's the thing. So we have one of the highest rates of this TB in the world, but also direct TB death have risen from 13,561 in 2007 to 15,087 in 2008. That is a huge increase. And that's about many years ago, 2007, 2008, or many years ago. That was a major crisis of TB in the country at that time. Why, when this is curable? Why, when we've got medication that can cure this? Why, why, why do we still, why do we, did we still have so many people dying from TB? There are many causes to this, which we'll delve into. But what is the cause of TB? It is the microorganism. Of course, it would be micro because it affects it. It's so small, you, would, you wouldn't be able to see it with your naked eye. So if someone with TB in the room was coughing or sneezing, and you wouldn't really know they have TB, right? You'd be sitting there and you catch TB in that way. You can't see it with your naked eye. Same as with the COVID-19 virus. When someone coughs or sneezes in your presence, and you happen to get in touch with that microvirus, then you would also be infected by it. So it's a similar uh, mechanism with the COVID-19. Not exactly, please, there are many differences. It's just similar in how you can uh, get infected by it. So what is that virus, the microorganism that causes TB? It's mycobacterium tuberculosis. Hence, we're calling this disease tuberculosis. It's caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it means this microorganism here is a bacteria, this bacteria that causes the TB. This here, this bacteria can attack any part of the body, but it is most common where? In the lungs. So any part of the body can be attacked by it. Others I've heard have skin TB, which is something I had never heard of before. But we'll focus today on what? On the one that affects the lungs, because we are dealing with the topic of respiratory diseases. If it was any other topic, then we'll delve into the skin TB and how it works. 
but just know that it exists. So this one attacks any part of the body, but it's very common in the lungs. And that's why you'd, you'd find people having symptoms of sneezing, coughing, sweating, and all of that. TB, like I've mentioned again, it is curable. But the medicine must be taken regularly for six months, even after patients feel better. And that's where most people get it wrong because it's, it needs to be taken regularly for six months. They often stop the cause of treatment halfway. They often stop the cause of treatment when they start feeling better. Maybe you start feeling better after three months, you stop the cause of treatment. And that is when it becomes stronger. This bacteria gains more strength and then now it becomes resistant to the medication that you are taking. So if you continue taking that same medication, you'd find it's not effective anymore because you have given it a chance to gain resistance. So that's why if you are given strict instructions by your doctor, take this medication this many times a day for six months, that is exactly what you need to do. Even if it's three months later and you are feeling better, continue your cause of the medication. If the cause of the medication is interrupted, the bacteria becomes drug resistant. Bacteria resistant to two or more antibiotic drugs are called what? Multi-drug, I'm sorry, I'm sneezing. I don't know if I have flu, but yeah. <laughs> Bacteria resistant to two or more antibiotic drugs are called multi-drug resistant TB or MDR TB. MDR meaning standing for multi-drug resistant TB. So this is in a case whereby maybe someone was given medication, they didn't finish their cause, and then the, the, the bacteria that they were infected by became resistant to that cause. Then they had to take another cause of antibiotics, and again, the bacteria became resistant to that other cause. So when now two or more antibiotic drugs have become resistant, or when two or more, when the bacteria has become resistant to two or more of those drugs, then that is now called multi-drug resistant TB. Now it's a very serious form of TB because we have minimized or decreased the number of drugs that can be effective in fighting off that bacteria. Bacteria resistant to three or more antibiotics are called an extreme drug resistant tuberculosis, which is XDR-TB. So, <coughs> XDRTB is way worse than MDRTB. But in the most ideal places, you wouldn't want to be having any resistant TB at all. Unfortunately, if you happen to acquire an XDRTB, then it wasn't really your doing, but it means you just have less drugs available to treat that bacteria. The situation here of TB is very serious. In 2016, 53 people in KZN were identified as having XDR-TB. And out of these 53 people, 52 died within 25 days of diagnosis. Guys, do you understand when we say 52 died out of 53? So that means only one person survived from this 53, this group of 53. And most of the people who are diagnosed with this TB were HIV positive. So there's a link there somehow, you know, the HIV virus, it weakens your immune system. And that's when you are prone to more diseases. And that's why if you are ever diagnosed with the HIV virus, then what do you need to do? You need to boost your immune system. I think we've come a long way about our understanding of the HIV virus now. We understand that it's really not a death sentence. Many people, have told their stories and they're surviving and living very fruitful, healthy lives with the HIV virus because they are taking care of themselves. They're taking the medication if need be. They are eating right. And therefore their CD4 count remains low and their immune system is strengthened. So even when all these other diseases and disorders try and attack, if they find that your system is strong enough, you can be able to survive. But unfortunately in this case of these 52 people who died, uh, it, must, it might have been the opposite thing. So in this diagram here, we're looking at what does a TB infected lung look like compared to a healthy lung. As you can see here, we're seeing the healthy lung. And then we are seeing this TB infected lung. 
The TB infected lung, you can even see the color, it's blackened in color now. It's not a clear color, it's not a natural color, it's black. It's almost like you can see there's, there's, a, there's an infection here. So this virus attaches itself to the lung and it seems like it's inflated, you know, it's like it has expanded. So there are many other symptoms that you can see. What are the symptoms and diagnosis of tuberculosis? If you find yourself having any of these symptoms, you might be, <laughs> you would need to get tested. And I'm laughing because these days it's so tricky. You know, when you look at these symptoms, they are very similar to the symptoms of, of what, of um, COVID-19. When people have chest pains, well, I haven't had coughing up blood as a symptom of COVID-19, but with the respiratory diseases, you find it's similar. That's why in these days, when you have flu, you should just not take it lightly. Maybe just think of it as COVID-19 and protect other people around you. So when you have any of the symptoms that are most common in respiratory diseases, it's best you think of it as a serious case. For as long as you haven't gotten tested, treat it as a very serious case so that you protect other people out there and you treat yourself to get better and heal, you know? So chest pains. Uh, but this coughing up blood, a cough with phlegm that goes on for more than three weeks. General symptoms also will include what? When you have high fever, you've got night sweats, you've got appetite loss, there's weight loss and unusual tiredness. What does this tuberculosis bacteria cause? When it's in the lungs, it will grow and cause what? Pulmonary tuberculosis. So it would affect definitely your pulmonary system and then you develop all of these symptoms. So if you have any of these symptoms, monitor them and then after then get tested if you should. Basic diagnosis of the tuberculosis, if you, if you feel you suspect you might have TB, or if maybe you have, you have been in contact with someone with TB, it's best you get tested so that when you detected early, treatment can also start early. So the basic diagnosis would be what? It would start with a chest X-ray or a skin test, depending on the type of TB, and a sputum test. So a chest X-ray will get to see, you see that image we've seen here. Yes, this would be a chest X-ray. That's where you'd see exactly the, 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 the condition of your lungs and see if there's any bacteria there growing there. And then sputum test as well. In a skin test, if you're taking a skin test, there'll be a fluid which will be injected under the skin of the arm. And the amount of swelling will show whether that person has TB or not, you know? So there are various tests and maybe it will depend on the doctor or clinic that you go to. TB and contagion. TB is very contagious, highly, highly contagious. And it spreads through air when infectious people sneeze, talk or spit. Same with COVID-19, right? When you are around an infectious person who is sneezing, talking or spitting, that infectious virus will travel through air, will spread through air. That's why uh, maintaining uh, social distancing is so emphasized because then even if it's spreading through air, when the social distance, then you have a greater chance or you minimize the risk of getting the virus. Or when you're wearing a mask, by the time that air with this virus comes to you, it would meet the barrier that is the mask, you know? So it is the same, it's the same precautions that we need to take. The, the precautions that we take from one respiratory disease or disorder, they are pretty similar. We should apply to all the others. So we're not just focused on COVID-19 now, mainly because COVID-19 became a, a pandemic. That's why we know so much about it but it's exactly how we should be treating all these other diseases and disorders of the respiratory system because most of them are spread through the air and that would make sense. It would be spread through the air because that's how the respiratory systems work, system works. You take in air from the external environment and you breathe out carbon dioxide back to the external environment. So the one sure way to, to ensure that you, will, you would get this respiratory disease is through air, the same mechanisms with which you take in oxygen, 
would be the same mechanism with which you would take in this virus that is contagious and would affect you. A person then can also have active or inactive tuberculosis. That means the ones who have active tuberculosis, they are able to pass this bacteria on to anyone they come into close contact with. And then the ones with inactive tuberculosis, which is called the dormant tuberculosis, it can stay dormant for years. You could have the TB, it's dormant for years, it doesn't affect you, it doesn't make you sick, but it would become very active if your immune system is weakened. Say you get HIV virus, then you would, then it would start being active, it would be activated at that point. So you wouldn't, you probably would be confused where exactly you got infected. That might be a case of the inactive TB. But what's important to note about this is you are still able to transmit it as well. So you'll never know, you can never tell with people. Yeah? So you need to protect yourself at all times. People can also carry latent tuberculosis. What does this mean? This happens when a person's body, you are able to fight the bacteria and not become ill. So these people here who, who have latent tuberculosis, they don't spread the TB and they don't even have the symptoms of the TB because this TB here in their system will remain inactive or dormant for a lifetime. So maybe when you're taking tests, you can find you have TB when maybe you're doing medical tests, general medical tests, but find that that TB is not affecting you in any way. In some people though, it can become active if the immune system is weakened. So that's what we've known. If was the, the sooner your immune system is weakened, then it would definitely affect you. Others, it wouldn't affect them. Others, it definitely affects them. But the trick here and the key to a healthy human being is to ensuring at all times that your immune system is strengthened through the foods you eat, through the lifestyle you live, through medication, if you're given medication, vitamins, minerals, you know, there are many ways. Protect yourself if you, you should. Ne? People with inactive TB are called what? TB carriers. That's what they call them. The trick, guys, is you can never really know who has, who's a TB carrier, who has latent tuberculosis, who has active or inactive tuberculosis. So you can't look at a person and determine what disease they have or what disorder they have. You do not do that, not with diseases, not with your health. Don't just look at the person and because they look clean and good to you, you suddenly think, no, this one is healthy. You cannot tell, especially with microorganisms, you cannot tell, okay? So you need to protect yourself. Even with COVID-19, you don't just go out there because this person looks healthy to you, 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 you just hug them or touch them as much as you want. Protect yourselves. Your health is very important. So put that first. Health is wealth. Remember that. And now, yeah, this is a, a, a very a topic that often goes un, undiscussed, especially in issues relating to health. What type of environment puts people at risk of TB infection? If you can look at South Africa, the majority of people or the highest stats of TB are found in informal settlements, places similar to what we see in the image here, where people are so close to each other, the houses are close to each other, we seem like an, a, a squatter camp, where people share a tap, maybe over 10 people or 20 people would share a tap, would share one space. If they would bath, they pour out their bath water just outside where everyone walks and everyone has Will be, will be affected by whatever they're throwing out. These are people with not no proper drainage systems where they stay. There is no proper water system, like I'm saying, even the taps. There's no proper toilet systems. They share toilets. They share such small spaces. The example would be with COVID-19. It was, it's always been emphasized, especially during level five lockdown. What was emphasized the most? Uh, staying at home, you know, stay at home, quarantine, 
social distance, self-isolate, all of those terms, which when you look at the societal issues and the social issues affecting many or the majority of people in the country in South Africa, it's not really feasible. How is social distancing, how is self-isolation feasible in an environment like this? in squatter camps where there are thousands of people staying in one area so close to each other, where in one shelter, in one squatter camp, you'd find over 10 people sharing that space. How then do you self-isolate? How then, if you, feel, if you have been, if you suspect you've been in touch with someone with the virus, how do you self-isolate in such an environment? Because by virtue of your living conditions, it makes it impossible. It also makes it impossible to even stay home during the level five lockdown. How, how are you supposed to stay in the house with 10 people at the same time? So there are many societal issues that if we are not responsible in the manner in which we conduct our research and treat our systems, it, 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 it oppresses many, many people. So if you ever go into fields of medicine or any field really, it's not just about the work you do in the hospital or the work you do in your office. There are also many societal issues and factors that we need to take into consideration, especially if you want to make a positive impact in the lives of the people that we serve, especially if you're going to get into public service. Then those you need to put people first, you need to consider people and how maybe the laws and rules that you are putting in place would affect them. How, if you're going to tell your patient, let's say this lady here just came from the doctor and was diagnosed, how exactly are you expecting her to, to, to protect others from herself if she's in such an environment? So please always be mindful of these issues, even in your work, regardless, sciences, engineering, technology, whatever field you end up in, you cannot, you can never separate yourself from the human factor. And if we want to have a positive impact in the lives of people and in our societies, we would need to put the needs of people first. Put uh, mitigation in place, make sure that people thrive regardless of the environment and surroundings they come from. Yeah? And then now we are on smoking. We know that smoking can cause many, many respiratory diseases there. Yeah? So it has many effects, but for some reason, there are still so many people smoking and that's a topic for another day. But anyway, small tobacco smoking is often referred to as what? The single most preventable causes of premature death. Can you imagine that? Single most preventable. I think this we need to highlight single most important preventable cause of premature death. This means the many people who have died due to whatever respiratory diseases they acquired through their uh, what smoking uh, habits, that was preventable. They could have prevented that. Smoking is therefore uh, divided into two categories. We've got active and passive smokers. Active smokers are the ones who, who, who themselves actively smoke. No, they actively smoke. But passive smokers, I think most of us have been public passive smokers because at, in public, especially, you'd be sitting next to a person who's smoking and you really don't have a choice and you don't have anywhere else to go. When you walk around, maybe you're in a taxi and the taxi driver is smoking or you're in a car and someone is smoking. There's a lot of times where we are passively smoking and you are and it's not really out of free will, you know? Actively smoking is whereby the person has made their conscious decision and choice that they want to smoke and therefore they do that, yeah? So smokeless tobacco, they've tried to come up with smokeless, more smokeless tobacco. So to continue, you know, there's a mitigation plan for those who want to smoke and to also try and protect the ones who what? Who, are, who don't want to be passively smoking. So this one is a solution, especially for uh, the passive smokers. So what do they do with this one? The smokeless tobacco, which is chewing, chewing tobacco. Others prefer this, chewing tobacco, tobacco pouches and snake, you know? We know snuff dipping, but we know snake. I think you've seen a lot of people with snake, especially the older generation. Eh? 
This is a major cause of what? Oral disease and death from oral cancer. So it's not as harmless as we'd like to think it is. Simply because there's no smoke doesn't mean it doesn't affect you negatively because tobacco is still present. That there is for the mere fact that there's tobacco present, then it would affect you negatively. A number of diseases, many of them fatal, associated with what? With smoking. These include what? Cancer. You know, cancer of many, many organs. You've got the lung cancer, larynx cancer, oral cavity cancer, pharynx cancer, esophagus cancer, pancreas, civic kidney, bladder. All of those types of cancers can, in one way or the other, be linked to smoking. We've got coronary artery diseases. You've got strokes. You've got chronic bronchitis and emphysema. All of these affect when you have any of these diseases or disorders. It means one part, any, one or more parts of your respiratory system has been affected. As you can see with the lungs, we know lungs are part of the respiratory system, right? Lungs are here. They are part of the respiratory system. Even the larynx, part of the respiratory system. Oral cavity, your pharynx. And then what else here is involved? Then the esophagus is not part of the respiratory system, not at all. But for the fact that maybe when you smoke, you smoke through your mouth, especially the ones with the oral, the smokeless tobacco who chew and eat this, you know, they, they put in this tobacco in their mouth, then it would affect the esophagus somehow. And then what the coronary artery diseases here, there might be blockages in the arteries, therefore causing you this coronary artery diseases, even strokes, it might affect the transportation of your blood to the brain, you know? Chronic bronchitis, this here affects again the respiratory system, as well as emphysema. Smoke contains what? Over 4,000 chemicals, over 4,000. That's like in, in, if you pass through smoke, you have been exposed to over 4,000 chemicals. 43 of them are carcinogenic, meaning they are cancer promoting, meaning those 43 chemicals will have exposed you to cancer promoting agents. And then it also contains what cellular irritants such as ammonia, formaldehyde and oxides of nitrogen, all of those ones you are exposed to. So smoke contains many, many chemicals and what compounds that are not good for your health. There's also carbon monoxide, which will bind to what? To hemoglobin. Remember when we studied about how oxygen can bind to hemoglobin or how carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin as a way of transporting it. In this case, it would be carbon monoxide, which will bind to the hemoglobin molecule because oxygen is supposed to be is to be binded to this hemoglobin it means now more carbon monoxide is binding to this hemoglobin there's now not enough hemoglobin molecules to bind to oxygen which your body actually requires now there's more carbon monoxide binding to the hemoglobin and therefore that's how it accelerates the deteriorating of your of your health the major component however is what there's nicotine, nicotine, which is found again in cigarettes. It has a variety of effects on the sympathetic nervous system in humans, and it is highly, highly addictive. That's how you find, why you'd find people who are smoking, but they don't really want to smoke anymore. Others got into smoking for various reasons, and there's very many, many reasons, you know? And when someone has made the decision that they probably just don't want to smoke anymore, it's difficult to stop because nicotine is very addictive. So once you are now addicted to it, it becomes difficult to stop. That's why someone who has been smoking for years finds it difficult to just stop because simply because they've decided to. Why? Nicotine would produce an increased heart rate, raise blood pressure, and increase discharge of sympathetic nerves in the autonomic nervous system. That's just how it might function. And then, now that we know about smoking and its effects, what are the effects of that smoking on gaseous exchange? Nicotine here, as we've just discussed, is the main, main ingredient in tobacco products. It is very poisonous, it is an addictive drug, and it slows down gaseous exchange. Remember when we discussed here that it might produce compounds 
that would bind to the hemoglobin. Eh? What else does it do? It constricts the blood vessels. It means what? What does? What do you mean by constrict? It narrows down the blood vessels. Instead of uh, what's relaxing them to allow more blood to flow, it constricts it. Almost like how when you are suffocating someone. So you, you are decreasing the space available for the blood to flow. And therefore, when this happens, the heart has to pump harder. Remember when we learned about hemostasis and how the body will always try to maintain balance. Because the blood vessels are constricted, the heart will try to pump faster to make sure that more oxygenated blood pumps through the body. That's what happens. And then tar in the smoke, the tar in the smoke, this black stuff that stays when you in the smoke, it will stick to the lungs. So the black that would probably stick to a wall when there is smoke is the same black that will stick to the lungs. So when, if you were ever maybe burning, let's say there's wood, and you see how the wood turned black because it was around smoke, or the walls turned black because it was around smoke, that's exactly what would happen in the lungs. The tar there would stick to the lungs. And when it sticks to the lungs, it builds up, it builds up, ending up to what? It destroys part of the gaseous exchange surface. Remember one of the requirements for efficient and effective gaseous exchange is to have a large surface area. Now when with the tar buildup, the surface area decreases over time. And then it, it provides again another negative effect on the system because if it, it, if it decreases the, the, the surface area, then gaseous exchange cannot occur effectively and efficiently. Over time then, as you can see with the tar buildup, with the nicotine constricting the vessels, over time, as you take in this nicotine over time, this, these negative effects continue and they build up. Then that's when you would end up having respiratory diseases. And then, as we briefly discussed, the non the smokers can also affect non-smokers passively through passive smoking. So even people, someone who has never smoked a day in their lives, who has never lit a cigarette a day in their lives, might have the same symptoms as people who are smoking because maybe they've been around people who smoke for so long that they too ended up being affected. And passive smoking is really dangerous. It's not just active smoking that's dangerous. Passive smoking is also dangerous and harmful to many other people too, not just, you know, even babies, especially to babies because their organs are still developing. Their vessels are not as strong anymore and not as strong as they are still developing their AI. So it's very harmful. So it is very, it's also illegal for people to what? Who smoke in the house. So it's, it's really their laws put in place against such and we'll discuss them. This is a lung here that has been affected by smoking. You can see the black over, all over this lung. You see the tar buildup, tar buildup. Now imagine this here, it's supposed to be, what's supposed to be passing here? Probably your gases are supposed to be passing, blood is supposed to be passing through here. But nothing, none of that can happen because why? The air that's supposed to pass through here, it's affecting the bronchioli, it's also affecting the alveoli because the tar buildup is around, it reduces the surface area of this gaseous exchange organ. Now, instead of having efficient space for the passage of the gases, what happens? There's tar there, blocking, blocking access, blocking passage. And that's how you would develop the disease over time. And then there are laws about smoking in South Africa because smoking is so dangerous and so harmful to one's health and could even lead to death. South Africa has laws about smoking. The reasons stated are why South Africa has anti-smoking laws. These are the reasons. It's illegal to smoke in any enclosed or partly enclosed public place. So if you're in a taxi, bus, restaurant, balcony, bar, office, school or hall, it is very illegal. It's illegal to smoke if that part you are smoking at is enclosed or partly enclosed. That's why in restaurants you find there's strictly a smoking area where those who want to smoke are put together to sit on one side there and smoke together. At least that smoke will affect only them and will probably just flow to the outside where it is more open. But it would be illegal if in such a small space, such as a restaurant, 
anyone can just smoke wherever they are sitting. So even in a school, maybe someone who's smoking there, they would need to smoke in a more open space, you know? It's always just being mindful about other people. So in an open space where air can flow freely, instead of suffocating other people in just one small enclosed space. No one may smoke in a car in which there are children under 12. So if you're driving a car and there are children under 12, no one is allowed to smoke because that is very harmful for them as well. No smoking is allowed in a private home that offers child care of schooling. So in a home whereby you have kids and maybe you have a crash or daycare, you cannot be smoking in that home. The owner of all these places, if they are found to allow and permit people to smoke, even though it's not allowed to, can be fined up to 50,000 rands. It is also illegal to advertise smoking. I think you have noticed when you think about it, I've never really seen an advert about a brand of cigarettes or anything like that. Never, hey? So it's illegal to advertise smoking. So people, and even in the boxes where when you're selling the, the, the cigarettes and other things that people smoke, there are often warnings that should be there on the box that this is harmful, this might affect your health negatively. So yes, whilst they may sell it, they will still need to warn people about the effects of that product. So again, moving on to respiration, there's what we call what artificial respiration. What is artificial respiration or technique? This is a way to make air flow in and out of the person's lungs if natural breathing is weak or stopped. So artificial respiration can be used, for example, if someone has recently stopped breathing due to drowning, respiratory paralysis, choking, heart failure, or smoke or smoke inhalation. So those two affect your respiratory system. And you can save a life by learning the artificial respiration technique Many lives have been saved by people who learned CPR and were able to, to save lives of people who it, at that moment really needed that intervention. Many, many lives. So I would encourage you to go learn first aid. You would never know who you might save, you know? You can learn to use it and perhaps save a life by going on a first aid course, you know? In an emergency outside a hospital, mouth to mouth resuscitation is used. So there are many cases where mouth to mouth resuscitation is used. Maybe you are at a park somewhere, a child is drowning. You can be able to save that life. Someone is choking on a sweet or something. You can be able to save that life if you understand the techniques of how to practice artificial respiration. So there are many ways. This is an, it's an old procedure, but you can always look for more updated procedures. Mouth to mouth artificial respiration. Here, you get to a person who is having difficulty breathing due to various reasons. Né? You would not know it first. So you, as a rescuer, push the victim's chin up, tilt their head back to prevent the tongue from blocking the throat. So that's the first thing you need to do. And then you also need to write, check for any blockages in the mouth. So maybe whatever is choking them is still in the mouth. You can be able to remove it. Just check for that. Then the rescuer would place the mouth over the victim's mouth and blow hard several times. It's difficult now. You see with this step, there are mouthpieces available now, which can allow you to perform mouth to mouth with the mouthpiece to protect both of you. Because remember, there are many other respiratory diseases we don't know of. What if the person you're rescuing has TB? What if you as the rescuer has TB or has COVID-19 or any other respiratory disease that might affect the other person negatively, where in a case where you are trying to save a life, you might be causing more harm. So there are now what we call mouthpieces that you can use. Instead of putting your mouth directly over your victim's mouth, you can put the mouthpiece. But this again, it also depends on how, it's a life and death situation really. So sometimes you weigh your options and you see which one is better, you know? But the key is always to save a life. If the victim does not respond, you need to position, position of the head has to be checked and process repeated for several minutes. For an adult victim, air is, born, is blown 12 times a minute. And for a small child, the rescuer would place their mouth covering the mouth and nose and blow more frequently and often. So the techniques 
will differ from a grown adult to a child and even for an infant. So you cannot use the same procedure for all three because these are all three different sizes, three different uh, human beings who can take up three different types of strains. Ne? Another method here is to blow into the victim's nose with the mouth shut. First aid kits, this is here what I was mentioning to you, have plastic shields with vi valves to do it to keep a rescuer safe from HIV infection and other infections, not just HIV, other infections as well. So I'd, I'd employ you to attend a first aid class or maybe watch more YouTube videos and practice, you know, you could really save a life. I think this is a skill we all need to have because we, you, you honestly never know where life would take you in certain situations and you could save a life. And then the last one for today is the effect of altitude on gaseous exchange. Altitude also affects human gaseous exchange. Ne? You know that there is more oxygen at sea level than at higher altitudes. And it follows that an increase in altitude causes a decrease in atmospheric pressure. So when there's an increase in altitude, there's a decrease in, in atmospheric pressure meaning that the air is getting more dense and dense as you go up, right? That is why at higher levels, you have less oxygen, but at sea levels, there's more oxygen because at sea levels, there is what? There's an increase in atmospheric pressure and the air is less dense at sea level. So effective breathing would be more difficult at higher altitudes because less oxygen gets to the alveoli and the body tissue. That's why people who climb, usually there are many fatalities at the very high mountains. You see Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Everest. There are many people who start the climb but don't finish it because as you go up, the higher the altitude you go, the less oxygen is available. And you find that when there are complications, people, some people don't survive, you know? Why? Because there's less oxygen there that's getting to the alveoli and the body tissue. The body reacts by breathing faster. As soon as you don't have enough oxygen traveling in your body, in and, you know, the body reacts faster by what you breathe faster. Your heart beats faster to ensure that you breathe. You have more, more breaths, more frequent breaths to be able to take in more oxygen and release the carbon dioxide. What that also happens by when a person takes deeper breaths. So you'd probably have the same reaction climbing up the mountain as you would running because you are taking, your body would need more and more oxygen to, 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 to replace the one that you are losing. Sports people in any discipline would know this, and altitude can seriously affect their performance. High altitudes produce two differing effects on the performance. In short burst events like sprinting, so those ones who sprint, for example, 100 meters and 400 meters, long jumps and triple jumps, Low atmospheric pressure would mean less resistance from the environment. So the athlete's performance is generally better. So this is on sea levels, right? But there's low, no, there at higher, higher altitude, the low, there's low atmospheric pressure at higher altitudes, low atmospheric pressure. There's less resistance from the environment and the, the, the performance is better. Yeah? But for endurance events whereby you are really like 5,000 meters or it's a marathon, no? The main effect is that the decrease in oxygen, there's a decrease in oxygen. So when there's a decrease in oxygen, it would affect your performance negatively. It would reduce your performance negatively. So yeah, when we look at these two, which athletic events are favored by high altitude? Between these two, this one was running, this one is high jump. Higher altitude, there's low atmospheric pressure. So this one was favored by a high, alt high altitude. Okay, uh, the body can be trained to do better with high, with high altitudes and decreased oxygen supply. How is that done? Altitude training would increase your speed, strength, and endurance. So the athletes maybe in, in sea level places like Cape Town and Durban might train for several weeks in Johannesburg with high altitude. 
but should find that the ones who train in Johannesburg or in places with high altitude would find it easier, easier to compete in places at sea level because they are used to training in places that required more endurance from them, that required more speed from them and more strength. So it becomes a bit easier when they get to a place with sea level. This then would increase their number of red blood cells, which will what? Which means more oxygen is available to the body. And that's why they would have performed better at sea level. Bochostrum in Northwest Province is known as a leading center for international and local athletes because its altitude of 1,400 meters provides a balance between altitude and quality training. So you, if you train in such environments, then you are most likely to be a very competitive and better athlete. So the sources Snapify, I use Snapify to access the Kev's textbooks. And the one most used for this lesson is the Via Africa Gate, grade 11 learner's book. Thank you so much. For any questions, email me. You can find me on this email address. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good luck for your exams. See you next time. Bye.